Before we get started in this episode, I want to speak to y'all directly for a minute. We're more or less at the halfway point of this whole thing, and I realize that to take this in as a series all at once, it can seem like I kind of hate this game. And sure, yes, there are most definitely aspects of it that I loathe, but I'd like to take a minute to redirect you to the very first thing I ever said in this series. Persona 5 is a great game. It's probably the best traditional JRPG I've played since, well, the release of Persona 4. There is a lot to love here. I didn't lie. There's not going to be some kind of bait and switch here or some bullshit like that. If I didn't like, help, love this game, then I wouldn't have had the patience to do the five playthroughs I've done just up to this point for this series. Persona 5 is, at its core, for whatever faults it may have, is a very, very good video game. And we will be talking about those reasons at length in the future. However, I bring this up for two reasons. One, because I've already been getting comments asking if I even still enjoy the game, and like, I can't really blame them, I was kind of harsh at points and was super harsh at the end of the last part, so I figured it would be best to step back and clarify my feelings for everyone's benefit. And because two, we're about to enter what is easily the worst chunk of the core game, and though I may love Persona 5, I have a personal vendetta against some of the shit we'll be seeing. Strap in, y'all, because we're going to kick this game in the dick! Once Futaba's arc ends, we enter a sort of calm before the storm period. This is a long-standing tradition for the Persona series. Persona 3 had it, Persona 4 had it, Persona 4 Golden had it in spades, Persona 5 had to have it. One of the greatest strengths of Persona as a franchise is how well it manages to structure and pace itself. It knows very well when, and more often than not how, to inject some much-needed moments of calm, levity, and humanity, usually dropping it right in the middle of the game to offset whatever serious happenings have occurred in the story up until that point, and sort of hit the emotional reset button before dropping a narrative bomb that will carry us through to the rest of the core narrative. It's one of the best storytelling tricks that Persona has at large. And Persona 5 does it? Fine. It's fine. It's not as good as 3 and 4's trip to the beach. It lacks the humor or intimacy that you'll find in either of those. But as a slice of life scene, it serves its purpose well enough. Not sure why we needed two, though. The Hawaii trip is fun, even if it does feel kind of rushed yet somehow also sort of meandering. While the beach scene manages to end very strongly with a solid character moment where Futaba officially commits wholeheartedly to the Phantom Thieves and our mission because, say it with me, Futaba is the best character in the game. Oh yeah, right, these two. You better believe that we're going to talk more about these two in the future, but for the time being, I'm going to choose to leave them as the afterthought that they deserve to be treated as, and just say that, uh, yeah, this sucks. A lot. Also, while we're here, say hi to what may very well be the only two men without light skin in game. They're adults preying on teenagers. Cool. Also close up on underage ass. Wait a minute, this scene is fucking awful! The next arc begins somewhat clunkily, though not as much as I think some people would like to paint it. With the addition of Futaba to the team, Morgana no longer has a real, dedicated role in the squad. Or at least not one that makes him feel secure in his place. As such, he begins to lash out whenever he feels his value to the team is being called into question. It can be easy to look at Morgana's behavior here and simply demand that he stop being an immature baby and get over it. But that's kinda just it. Morgana is an immature baby. He is characterized from the very beginning as being someone whose mouth is routinely writing checks that his ass cannot cash. And he seems to often know that's the case. His arrogance and supposed gentleman suaveness is much more founded in performance than any sort of reality. And we see that coming to a head here. Up until this point, Morgana was able to use the fact that he understood the metaverse better than anyone else as a means to protect his self-image. But now, that's been taken from him. 
Does that make it right for him to react in the petulant, entitled way he does? No, not at all. But it does mean that it makes sense, and that it does kind of work as a way to get some legit character growth. Morgana does become less of an obnoxious brat after this. Not to mention that it is pretty satisfying to see Morgana have to show some goddamn humility for 10 seconds. The real issue here isn't the story itself, but rather where it's placed in the game. Persona 5's arcs have had a very distinct structure up to this point. We meet a character, we get to know them, we discover that a bastard man is looking to exploit them in some way or another, we team up with them to take down said bastard man, they permanently join the team. This is the basic format of the arcs in Persona 5 that introduce characters. The only arc that doesn't follow this general structure is Futaba's Palace due to its nature as a Persona 4 fanfic. Everywhere else though, this is how it works. Just so we're clear, this isn't a bad thing. It's good to have a solid framework to build your story off of. The hero's journey is a thing for a reason. And the game does try to use this framework for the next party member as well. This is where Morgana's story starts to become a problem though. Persona 5 tries really hard to have its cake and eat it too here by attempting to use Morgana's storyline as the character introduction for Haru while keeping the same overall story format the rest of the game has used. And it doesn't really work for a number of reasons. First and foremost, the game seems to care considerably more about Morgana's story than Haru's. For every one minute of screen time that Haru gets to build her character and story, it seems like Morgana gets five. This means that we don't really get to meet Haru in the way that we meet everyone else. Like, Yusuke's intro may have been a train wreck, yes it is, shut up, I'm not changing my mind on it because I'm right, but at least I came out the other side understanding a good deal about his personality, what he's been through, and why he is the way he is. What do we learn about Haru from this arc? Well, we learn that she's basically as pure and wholesome as a horde of Pichus and sweeter than bee vomit, and that she is in a really bad place right now, but that's about it. Not to downplay the seriousness of what she's going through, but the issue here is that she has no strong personal want in the way that all the other characters have. There's nothing like Makoto blackmailing us because she wants to help her fellow students, or Ryuji and Anne working to take down Kamoshida because they actively want justice and revenge. Notice how both those things tell us something about who those characters are and what they ethically value. Over the course of this arc, though, it feels like Haru never really gets that. She has a desire to avoid harm to herself, no doubt, and that does make for some good conflict, but it doesn't reveal any kind of strong motivation at her core. Simple wants to avoid harm don't tell us nearly as much as strong, nuanced wants do. For example, imagine that Ryuji literally only wanted to take Kamashita down because he was threatening to expel him on false grounds. Still a good conflict, but then we lose all of those moments where we get to see that, underneath his hot-headed, dense-as-a-rock exterior, Ryuji is someone who cannot stand injustice in the slightest and will always be the first to retaliate against it when he sees it happening to the point where it's actually sort of a problem. His want to protect members of the volleyball team reveals a lot about him and his values, but Haru lacks anything like that. She never really puts herself at risk for the sake of helping others, only really to help herself, justifiable as it may be. As a result, we come out the other side not really seeing what she's made of. The other issue, though, is that, tonally, the two stories present brutally clash with each other in the worst kind of way. Basically, every scene with Morgana is, on some level, played for laughs. The game certainly takes Morgana's feelings seriously, but it also makes it clear that the situation isn't that dire. It's nothing that can't be talked out. It's hijinks, and that's fine. That's a good tone for this story to have. However, it's juxtaposed next to this story about a rich businessman trying to sell off his daughter to an abuser for the sake of gaining clout in both the political and professional worlds of Japan, which I hope we can all agree means it meets the scientific requirements for being given a yikes out of 10. These stories more or less happen concurrently for the beginning of the arc, and it gives me emotional whiplash of the soul. One minute we're having a wacky chase scene through the MC Escher sewer, and the literal next minute we gotta see this unredeemable shit specter doing the kind of vile shit that only unredeemable shit shit specters do. This is what I mean when I say Morgana's story is more poorly placed than it is strictly bad. Structured as it is, it ultimately only stands to distract from the more interesting and serious events happening adjacent to it while starving them of some much needed screen time. All in all, I hesitate to say that the lead up to this palace is bad in any kind of traditional sense. It serves well enough to set up a strong motivation, it does show that Okumura is a right bastard man deserving of a good old fashioned heart stealing, and it does give us a couple nice character moments with Morgana. 
but it leaves the character this arc is supposed to introduce kind of in the dust, and we'll be feeling that failure with her throughout the rest of the game. This arc was good for overall character building, certainly, but it failed to build on the one who needed it the most. I really messed up. All of this of course culminates with Akumara's palace, whose quality could best be annotated using this graph. You see, it starts up here with some really cool scenery and fun ideas for set pieces, maybe not the best thing ever, but still really good, still memorable, but then the dungeon just keeps happening and oh no, oh no, how could we have let this happen? Oh god, what hubris hath man wrought! Let's break it down, shall we? This palace is made out of five parts. The entrance, the barracks, the export line, the production line, and the transfer line. Each one of these has its own distinct gimmick, which results in a variety of quality that, well, yeah. Perhaps the single best moment this entire palace has to offer is in its first impression in the entrance. Regardless of how this palace can fail on a design level, it absolutely nails it with its aesthetic elements. It's hard not to be taken aback by the spaceport at first glance, cause look, I'm not saying that spaceports are the last place I'd picture thieves stealing valuables from, but it's definitely not the first place my mind would go, and the game does a great job of selling it with some really cool visuals in what is debatably the best theme song for a palace in the game. This palace never really slips up on a tonal level. From beginning to end, you feel like you're in, well, maybe not a space station, but at least something vaguely space related. It works and it means that the atmosphere of this palace is seldom, if ever, wanting. This leads into the barracks, which, despite suffering from generally being a bit too large and having the most plain environments the dungeon has to offer, does feature a memorable and fun side objective by way of having to deduce who the manager of each section is based on incomplete information gathered by eavesdropping on their abused employees. Kind of unfortunate that you can't really get caught eavesdropping in any meaningful way, but nonetheless still serves as one of those nice little moments that makes you feel like the thief you're supposed to be. Especially in conjunction with the level design here, which lends itself really well to consistently getting ambushes. It's not the best thing ever or anything, but it's, you know, good. It's, it's good. It does not make me want to die. Yet. Completing the barracks grants access to the export line, which isn't as good as the barracks, but still competent enough. This section does try to depict the kind of suffering that Okumura puts his workers through, and while it is somewhat effective, we're just going to put a pin in that for a minute. As for the actual level design on display, it's basically just a linear path that is totally functional. This segues into the production line, which might not be terrible, but is definitely one of the more obnoxious gimmicks in this game. Having to stop over the machinery for a limited time to sneak by is a fun diversion at first. But then you realize that the 30 second timer still continues if you hit an enemy. And then you realize that hitting an enemy means that you will almost certainly have to start the timer again. Which means having to hear the announcement declaring the timer is started again. And then you realize that, huh, there aren't a whole lot of places to ambush enemies around here. You just kind of have to hope you hit them first a lot of the time. And because of the nature of the timer, it's usually in your best interest to clear out all the enemies in the area before starting it. And holy shit, this is so tedious and obnoxious. Again, credit where credit is due. It does feed well back into the theme of Okumura overworking his workers, and again, we're going to put a pin in that. But suffice to say, it's not really worth it. Mechanically, it's not fun or interesting enough to be good gameplay, nor is it miserable enough to really capture the kind of suffering his workers have endured. I honestly think I would have liked this more if it were less fun. I'm not against being made to do something annoying in a game if it's done for a good narrative purpose. Hi, my name is Ryan, and I really, really like the microwave corridor at the end of MGS4. But this chunk of gameplay is too bland to meet that suffering qualifier, yet too eager to waste my time to really count as anything traditionally good. However, the production line might as well be World 1-1 for all it has to offer in comparison to the transfer line. The transfer line may very well be the single worst chunk of gameplay in the whole of Persona 5, and it is without question the worst puzzle the game has to offer. At its best, this puzzle is double the obnoxious waste of time that the production line was, with a ton of watching static animations, few chances to fight enemies, with even fewer chances to sneak up on them. At its worst, it is a poorly communicated chore, bereft of any kind of satisfaction or fun to be had in its completion. This is true about it from beginning to end, but most of all in the puzzle's final stage. Okay, so here's how it works. Every time you flip one of these switches, it activates one of the doors it's connected to. But going through doors makes whatever door you went through shut off while turning on whatever door it's connected to. 
that second point isn't nearly as well communicated as it should be. You're supposed to learn it from this scene right here, but clearly it didn't land for a lot of people, myself included. And look, I would normally be more than willing to accept that maybe I'm just a bit of a dum-dum, but everywhere I looked at discussion about this palace in preparation to make this video had at least a handful of people calling it out as the worst part of the dungeon. I don't think I'm alone in this. Here's the real issue. You see this screen? The one that's supposed to have everything happening on it? Forget it. It's useless. Kill all the enemies in the area, then stop looking at it. What you want to focus in on is this, the minimap. This makes it easy to see which doors are connected to each other since they're clearly color-coded on there, which in turn makes it a million times easier to figure out what it is you need to do. But even that's finicky. You see, this switch? It unlocks a door that's outside the view of the minimap, in a completely different part of the station. I do not generally like being this harsh on relatively minor stuff like this, but this is just kind of straight up poorly designed in basically every way it could be, and is the only section of the game to ever stop me dead in my tracks because I just could not figure out what to do and had to resort to just brute forcing it because it couldn't be bothered to properly give me the rules. But again, I really want to emphasize that even now, knowing exactly what this section is and what I need to do to get through it, the transfer line still sucks. It's still slow, it's still tedious, it's still a chore, it still lacks anything that makes this game fun or exciting. It doesn't make you feel like a thief, it doesn't do anything to demonstrate how Akuma is a terrible person, it does nothing except waste the time of every poor soul forced to endure it. And all of this doubly sucks because this ill-conceived mess may actually be the coolest looking section of the entire palace and it just breaks my heart to picture the talented concept artists who had to see their striking designs turned into this. Not that how it looks really matters by the end since you'll be looking at the minimap the majority of the time if you know what's good for you. I may not like every part of every dungeon, but this is the only part in the entire game that I feel should have just been straight up cut. Anticlimax be damned. This is the danger of shifting from randomly generated dungeons to handcrafted levels. The handcrafted levels are going to be way better and more memorable if you do it right. But God help you if you fuck it up. I'm really messed up. Thankfully, there's still the boss. In this case, literally. The waves of increasingly difficult enemies sent by an overlord design is one that is used often, but not quite often enough for it to feel tired. And it is used to strong effect here. On a mechanical level, while it is slightly disappointing to have a big part of the fight be enemies we already face to some degree, each wave still manages to present an interesting challenge. Either due to complementary wave compositions with enemy weaknesses covering for each other, or due to the introduction of a wholly new enemy altogether. They may in effect just be standard enemy encounters, but having to fight them one after another with no serious downtime to do team upkeep does serve to make them feel separate from standard fights. If we're being honest though, it's the countdown timer that really serves to add a much needed layer of tension that this fight needed to work. Having that gun to the back of your head causes every interaction to feel weighty and important because everything will cost time and on that first playthrough, you won't know how much time you need as the waves keep coming. As it turns out though, Akuma will send out six waves before sending out the Execu-Robo that acts as the primary boss. On first play, six waves is just about the perfect amount to force most players into needing to stress about whether or not you're going fast enough for the timer's liking. It's really easy to get four waves in and start wondering just how many of these guys you're going to have to take down. And it's that tension, in conjunction with the carefully considered enemy waves, that makes these fights feel like they're truly part of a boss encounter rather than just a series of fights with random enemies, even before we've seen the true big bad. Surprisingly though, even knowing how this fight worked during my replays did little to make it less tense. Those first six waves never feel like fluff or busy work because they do have real consequence. The game gives you a very generous amount of time to complete this fight, but you still have to, you know, try. It's enough that you have no choice but to stay invested. It can be a bit of a drag at time, sure, but knowing that there's a big fight at the end of this makes it much easier to stomach. Speaking of which, the Execu-Robo itself is probably the most basic boss fight in the game. It has no weaknesses or resistances, there's no complex gimmicks or multiple pieces to deal with, this is just a straight up punch out with a time limit. Heal, buff, attack, block on super moves with windups. Do that, then punch Akumura, and congrats, you've won. Simple, but effective given the context and the lead up. 
At this point, we've had gimmicky boss after gimmicky boss, and most of those bosses are good, but it's so varied in design that it honestly feels refreshing to just have a nice big punching bag to wail on for a while. Likewise, this simplicity also kinda matches where we're at narratively. This is the height of the Phantom Thieves' reign. Everyone loves us, we're batting a thousand, and it certainly feels like we've gotten our full party assembled. Of course we're going to steamroll this thing, we're the Phantom Thieves. No matter how many of his flunkies he sends to their death, it was never going to be enough because we're the heroes of the world right now. But boy does he send a lot of flunkies. <laughs> This fight is basically the only place where we get to see Okumura being a bastard firsthand, with him personally sending out wave after wave of what are, in his mind, actual people out to die at our hands, occasionally even ordering them to kill themselves in his name. Then of course there's his deceit and betrayal with Haru, illustrating that he wasn't exaggerating when he said he would do anything to avoid failure even if it meant betraying others. It's good characterization, and it does serve to make Akuma seem like a right bastard. What's interesting to think about, though, is that this mentality seems to have only ever rewarded him in this world up until this point. Like, yeah, he's being taken down now, but we're only doing that because we're being manipulated by the people above him. People who aren't disposing of him due to his eagerness to betray, but rather because he's just outlived his usefulness. Likewise, who's going to take over the company once he's out of the picture? I mean, all his underlings are sycophants and yes-men, right? Ones that would most likely share his morality, or lack thereof, to some degree or another? I don't think Akuma is the type to value a wide array of moral perspectives in his inner circle. He ain't no philosopher king. I'm basically just picturing how Hyperion works in Tales from the Borderlands. Animals. There's basically no way in any kind of realistic scenario, which is what this more or less wants to be, where we don't immediately wind up with someone who's basically the same as Okumura, causing the exact same problems. And now that you mention it, pretty sure we never hear anything about worker conditions being improved after we take down Akumura. What evidence do we have that any of this means anything for anyone other than Haru? It kind of feels like this whole system is rotted from the inside out, and we're just taking down someone who is, yes, a vile dirtbag, but the systems of power that rewarded his evil actions and put him there are still in place, ready to replace Akuma with yet another just like him. Above the machine that Akuma controls, there is an even larger, more powerful machine that views Akuma as just another disposable cog in its machine. And that machine had no problem with how he treated his workers or anyone else he destroyed the lives of, even outside of the Big Bad's machinations. Nations. Maybe, just maybe, this says something about the world of Persona 5, and, by extension, the world we live in. Hmm. Well, either way, this boss is pretty good, eh? The dungeon might be a mixed bag, but there's something to be said for starting strong and ending strong, and this palace most certainly does that. And don't worry about that whole humor thing too much, because we're never going to really talk about him again in any significant way, because that arc's over. Don't stress about it. Hey, look, over there, are those confidant arcs? Yeah, they are! And this time, we're going to talk about Ichiko Oya, Toranosuke Yoshida, and Haru Okumura. You know how this goes by now. Before we get started, there are two small things that I want to mention about Oya that I couldn't really figure out how to integrate organically, but I still think are worth mentioning. First, she, more than any other non-party confidant member we meet, is transparently living under the thumb of the powers that be. While every other confidant may have problems going on in their lives, it generally feels like those problems are cordoned off to their own story events. Sure, EY may have a Yakuza thug threatening the life of him and his child, but he will still always be sitting behind this counter, ready to sell you whatever you need, never mentioning the problems in his life unless you bring them up. Oya, though, will always be found here, in this bar, trying to get just a moment of reprieve from the dystopian nightmare she finds herself in. Her life is a complete mess, and we really get a sense of that. Secondly, I kind of really like her design. She may be the only major female character who I am firmly convinced wasn't conceived on any level to be sold as a figma. She doesn't really fill any kind of traditional romantic archetype. In fact, as we'll discuss in a minute, she's actually pretty unlikable a lot of the time. This normally wouldn't be too big a deal for me. However, in a game where it all too often feels like the characters were developed as body pillows first, characters second, I can't help but find it deeply refreshing to not feel like I'm being told I should be instantly pelvic thrusting in her direction just because she's a woman. She's not your waifu, she's your drinking buddy. And sure, maybe you want that in your dream girl, but it's generally not an attractive trait to most. Especially in Japan. She feels real, and I think that's cool. Now, with that established, Oya is one of the most unique confidants that Persona 5 has to offer, which may go a long way to explaining why she seems to be so divisive. 
At a glance, Oya isn't an especially likable character. Her first and foremost quality is that she is a sad and occasionally obnoxious drunk. She is more than a little bitter about everything in her life and, depending on how many drinks in she is, will be more than happy to let anyone in earshot know about it. Her confidant ranks are comprised in no small part of her ranting about why her life sucks, why her job sucks, and why she sucks in between knocking back glass after glass of whiskey. In a vacuum, it's pretty off-putting. It's not fun to listen to a whiny drunk in real life. It's not fun here. And if that's all there was to her, she'd be a pretty miserable character. Where she picks up, however, is the reason she's so resentful. Oya is, at her core, someone who wants to do good for the world, but has learned firsthand that doing good isn't just as simple as going out and trying to do good. In rank 5 of her arc, we learn that at the start of her career, Oya was a dedicated political journalist who sought to fight back corruption and evil by revealing the misdeeds of a major politician. And that crusade ended with her getting thoroughly sandbagged by the powers that be. Now she's saddled with writing an entertainment column that she absolutely despises, while her partner is framed for murder. Evil gets to play by rules that good isn't allowed to, and trying to do good in the wrong places can and will destroy your life. Oya isn't a bad person by any means. In fact, she may actually be up there with Makoto in regards to how strong her sense of justice is. She tried incredibly hard to make the world a better place, but she got chewed up and spat out for it. So, what can you do about it? For Oya, the answer is obvious. Get plastered, stay angry, and hope that maybe one day you'll have a chance to make things better in some small way. Which, gotta say, a little relatable. Her cynicism isn't arbitrary, it's something that's grounded in lived experience. Part of growing up with a desire to do good in the world inevitably means realizing that your youthful enthusiasm to tear down injustice on its own isn't ever going to be enough to fix the world's problems. At best, such issues are so complex and impenetrable that a single person can seldom make a significant difference. And at worst, trying to help in the wrong ways can see your entire life torn to shreds. And while I might not know anyone personally who's been targeted by high-level government officials for trying to expose their corruption, I do know a ton of people who entered early adulthood eager to do good that quickly became disillusioned when they discovered just how difficult that actually is. I know a lot of Oya's in real life. Hell, I've been in Oya before. Where she's at in her life right now might not do much to make her enjoyable, but for my money, it definitely makes her understandable. It also means that she works effectively as a dark mirror to what may very well happen to the Phantom Thieves once they enter adulthood. It's not hard to picture a timeline where Makoto enters the police force with the desire to reform society, but ends up corrupted at best, and dead at worst. I mean, that's basically what happened to her entire family. Oya's story isn't just about her. It's also about us, and our pursuit of justice, and how that pursuit may be stalled by opposition in the world. But it's also about how we should go about dealing with that. You can just lie down and rot when the forces that oppose you hit back. Or, you can get back up, and take another swing. Over the course of this arc, we get to see Oya time and time again choose the ladder. And for it, she gets absolutely crushed. Again. This is one of the handful of times where I would say we are more than justified in using our powers to help out one of our friends. She is someone who is being punished for trying to do the right thing. And if that's not the kind of person we should be helping, then I don't know what else we'd be using these powers for. This is doubly true seeing as this situation comes about as a result of her character growth, rather than it being used as a way to keep her from actually confronting her problems. Once you dig past the drunken rantings and ramblings, there is a really nice story here that does tie well into the game's stated theme. All of that said though, you do have to do some serious digging to get there. As much as I may have been able to wring some amount of meaning out of her arc, it doesn't change that it's debatably the most boring to actually sit down and play through. We stay in one location for nearly the entire run, Oya doesn't really change so much as she reaffirms and doubles down on her already generally correct beliefs, and, as I freely admitted a couple minutes ago, she can be more than a little obnoxious and unlikable. Most of what's on offer here is only compelling once you start picking apart the themes and subtext and start seeing how it works in conjunction with the rest of the game. On its own though, it can feel meandering and tedious. However, it still almost certainly gets far more hate than it deserves and, in many ways, is probably the most underrated arc. But that doesn't mean it's without its flaws, and I'd be lying if I didn't say they drag it down to a point where I might not be able to agree with the dislike, but I can certainly understand it. Still pretty good in my eyes though. 
Also, kinda sucks that her ability is basically the worst in the game, but hey, at least we get some charm points while we're here. Also, also, Lala Escargot should have been a confidant too, goddammit. She's only got like two dozen lines, but she's still more interesting and compelling than Jihaya and Hifumi combined. Man, I didn't realize how much I actually respected this arc till I wrote this. This is like the opposite of what happened with Hifumi. Hmm. Anyways, who's ready for Japanese Bernie Sanders? <laughs> More than perhaps any other character, Tornosuke Yoshida is here to represent older people that are deeply sympathetic and supportive of the young, to no benefit to themselves. Yes, I know Sojiro is right there, wait for next episode. Yoshida is a politician who himself has been on both the beneficial and detrimental ends of corruption. Right off the bat, it's made abundantly clear that he is a person who gave in to the allure of easy money and power in his youth. However, it's also made equally clear that he is someone who has grown to realize how wrong that way of thinking was, and is desperately seeking a way to not just make it right, but also prevent others from slipping into the same self-imposed trap that he did. He is someone who wants to help out society not in some kind of cynical bid to gain power, but because good people often need power to do good things. And doing good things is the moral duty of every citizen. This is an interesting perspective for Persona 5. The overwhelming majority of the stories here are about directly experiencing disempowerment and oppression, especially that imposed by the older generations. But Yoshida is not one of them. We find out later that, yes, he was in fact a victim of an abuse of power, but he doesn't know that for most of his own story. If anything, he sees it more as him atoning for the foolishness of his youth. He's not someone who's trying to do the right thing because he's been wronged. He's someone who's trying to do the right thing because they've done wrong. And that's a meaningful distinction that plays into his character. This is why he's so eager to take someone like the protagonist under his wing, not just to guide him down a path where he will do good, but also where he won't sabotage himself in the way that he did. Additionally, this plays a large role in justifying how firmly incorruptible he is. Throughout his storyline, Yoshida is given numerous opportunities to assist and be close to those who already have power. And every time, he rejects them the moment they say he'll have to give up his goal of being a Diet member to do it. For better and for worse, he does not have any interest in supporting his peers in any way that would interfere with his already unwinnable Diet election. For him, this is his responsibility. And whether due to not wanting to force that burden on someone else, or due to lacking trust in his peers to do what needs to be done, he absolutely refuses to hand it off. This does a great job of showing the importance of staying true to your beliefs even in the face of temptation, which is well and good, but we're just going to put a pin in that as well for the time being. Interestingly though, he stays true to this all the way up to what even he considers certain defeat. However, he's made peace with this, claiming that all that really matters is that he was able to inspire and assist someone anyone from the younger generation to try and make the world a better place. In a moment where he thinks his story is finally done, he reveals the truth about it. This isn't about him. This is about all of us. On the upside, this results in one of the most potent themes the game has to offer. It's okay if you can't fix every problem in the world. So long as you leave the world better than you found it, and do your best to prepare the next generation to take better care of it than you could. It's honestly one of the best messages that Persona 5 has, and it speaks really well to the generational tension present in both America and Japan. And while it may be debatably lacking in some nuance, it is still very refreshing to see this game take a hard stance on some kind of societal problem. Though to be fair, pandering to people under the age of 35 in your high school dating sim JRPG is hardly the artistic risk of the century. It's pretty easy to not be afraid to take a stand like that when you know the group you're taking shots at is also nowhere near your target audience, but hey, the attempt is still noted, and it pulls it off with a kind of conviction that you won't easily find elsewhere. However, this is not without its problems. Yoshida's thematic strength and likability come at the expense of making him kind of just a bland character. He is a very flat character from beginning to end. Yoshida on rank 1 acts almost exactly like Yoshida on rank 10. The biggest change is that he regains his confidence to stand up to those who call him out for his past deeds, in particular being called No Good Tora. This is a character flaw in the traditional sense without question, but it's one that doesn't really tie into the core narrative. Him overcoming it doesn't really have anything to do with the job offers he gets, and he never really considers dropping out of the election or anything extreme as a result of that anxiety. It doesn't even really keep him from engaging in public speaking, he's still more than able to give rousing speeches whenever he may need to, hence why we ask him to teach us how to do it. Rather, this traumatic trigger is just sort of there as a way to generate spontaneous conflict in any rank event that may need it, but is generally not evoked during the real plot points. 
Yoshida may grow out of his insecurity, but the person underneath that insecurity, his personality, values, beliefs, etc., do not change from beginning to end. You could cut out everything about that anxiety, and nothing about the story would really change. Now, does that make it bad? Well, let's look at it this way. For those of you who may not know, there are basically two kinds of character arcs. Flat and round. Round characters are defined by their growth and change. Futaba, for example, is a very round character. Basically everything in her story ties back into her trying to improve herself and becoming a better person. Yoshida, however, does not change, because Yoshida is never wrong. This is what it means to be a flat character. These are characters who are less about changing themselves and more about changing the people and world around them. And some of the best and most interesting characters in fiction have flat arcs. But it does stand in sharp contrast to basically every other arc where we're more or less there to act as the catalyst to someone else's rebellious awakening. And it's not like the protag is going through an emotional journey. He has no feelings that I don't give him, goddammit. Yoshida seems to have become a fully realized person shortly after he was booted out of politics in his youth. All the maturing he needs to do is basically done already. As a result, there's no real development in Yoshida's story for anyone. It's there more as a parable than anything, an example of the kind of convictions you should have rather than an examination of how someone has to use them in any kind of practical sense. He absolutely refuses to change throughout and is only ever rewarded for it, all for the sake of communicating its theme. Fortunately, like I said, it is a good theme. But just sitting here watching a perfect old man be perfect can make a lot of it feel preachy because we only ever see him rewarded without being seriously challenged. And the fact that we never see him seriously challenged on his beliefs is especially weird because, in case you didn't notice, this dude's a politician. <laughs> Pop quiz. What political party does Yoshida belong to? Nope, not the Liberal Co-Prosperity Party. That entirely fictional political party is the group that his political party was going to secede from. So, what is it? Answer is that we don't know. Game never says. This causes us to run headfirst into Yoshida's biggest problem. What even are his politics, exactly? He is shockingly apolitical for being a politician. His views are incredibly vague, presumably in the hopes that the audience will simply project their own politics onto him. I mean, I want to think that most people would agree that he feels vaguely left-leaning, but I don't know! Maybe that's just me projecting my own shit onto it. Maybe I can't tell because the game refuses to talk about it. Maybe someone more right-wing than me would read him as being someone who was unjustly torn down by PC culture after calling a constituent an idiot, and now he's just looking for his chance for revenge. Dear God, did we just help a xenophobe ultra-nationalist get elected? What if Yoshida doesn't believe in democracy and thinks that only the Emperor has the divine right to rule? What if Yoshida wants to abolish the right to vote, forcing us all to live under his iron-fisted rule? The end is nigh! <laughs> I'm being facetious here, of course. But it is a legitimate problem with some damning consequences for the story. This lack of explicit policy makes it hard to judge whether or not he's making the right calls here. I mean, who's to say that this dude doesn't have way better ideas than Yoshida? What makes Yoshida so special? We have no way of knowing. It also weakens his core point a good bit, cause yeah, great dude, stay true to your convictions, but you mind telling us what those convictions, you know, are? And these factors, both the lack of character growth and the inability to take a serious stand, means that all this arc ultimately has to offer is just some cozy words about how important it is to support the next generation. All while never seeing him do anything that actually does that, aside from helping us. Hell, when a younger politician asks him for help, he turns him down. He explicitly rejects a chance to support the new generation when offered, which would maybe be justifiable if we knew about a specific policy position that kept him fully determined to do it his way, or just any half-good reason why he doesn't help out any one of the many people seeking his assistance, outside of his own desire to just do it himself. But we've got nothing else to work on here. So again, what makes him better than this guy? Yeah, he's got a good heart and he's a cool dude, presumably, but so is my uncle, and I do not want my uncle taking a seat of political authority, thank you very much. I feel like I'm overselling it a bit at this point because I do sincerely believe that Yoshida's confidant is one of the better ones. He is nothing if not likable, and his scenes are always fun to watch because he is so easy to root for, especially after finding out his backstory. You can see him trying so hard in so many ways that it's basically impossible to not respect him. And if he were a real person, I would want nothing but good things for him. But as a confidant in Persona 5, his story doesn't feel as strong as it could be. It's an A-tier confidant that could have very easily been an S. 
In many ways, Yoshida is almost the opposite of Oya. Where she can be unlikable but has a story that generally rewards you for thinking on it, Yoshida is amazingly charismatic, but his story begins to feel very hollow if you actually put any thought into it. This arc could have been great, maybe even one of the best, but without possessing either a compelling character arc nor a complex theme, all you're really left with is a platitudinous narrative that is so style over substance that it feels like a bad episode of Steven Universe. However, also like Steven Universe, it's still pretty good even when it's bad because the main character is a perfect angel I would die for. Now for the moment you've all been waiting for, the award for the biggest wasted opportunity in Persona 5 goes to... Haru Okumura! Come on down, and we'll take turns pretending you didn't watch your father die in front of your eyes- JESUS CHRIST! I like Haru. Let's get that out of the way right now. I think she's an interesting character with an enjoyable personality, and I think she has some of the most unique plot points this game has to offer. Likewise, I think her confidant is... fine. Really, it's fine. It has a good message, and Haru does some worthwhile growing in it. It's fine. It's totally fine. But here's the thing. Haru is a character with so many potential routes for rich and thematically relevant exploration that it's embarrassing. We're talking about the daughter of a billionaire who was nearly traded off into sexual servitude against her wishes for the sake of profiting two international corporations who has finally acquired the power to enact some serious change both with the power of her persona, but more so is the new majority shareholder of that massive business. And with all of that, what do they decide to do? fucking story about farming like grandpappy did, and learning that sometimes you just need to be an adult and plainly communicate your emotions and plans with the people they involve. And that's like, it's fine. Really, it's, it, it's totally fine. Sure, it doesn't really have anything to do with the theme of rebellion and really farming? Not even going to bring up the recently murdered father in any kind of grieving capacity or, nope, uh, uh, okay then, okay, yeah, no, this is definitely fine, yeah, cool. Cool, 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 I bring this up first because otherwise I would have to qualify basically every part of this with, yeah, not sure why we're talking about coffee beans right now when it feels like you should definitely have some bigger shit to work through. You always think it's going to get revealed as a coping mechanism. Never does. It's an air that hangs over not just Haru's confidant story, but the entire game at large in a way. Every member of the cast has gone through some kind of truly dark shit, but they also all inevitably deal with it one way or another. Futaba talks extensively about how her traumas have shaped her and what she wants to do to move past them. Ryuji and Anne each eventually begin to take agency over their life and use it as fuel to take down their abuser. Yusuke legitimately agonizes about whether or not his relationship with Madarame ever meant anything, both in the core narrative as well as his confidant arc, etc. Haru, however, never really gets this. She has all of these massively personal and traumatic things happening all around her while new stresses in her life just pile up one after another, and she just kind of treats it like it's not that big of a deal. This would be fine if she were someone like Sai who's meant to be strong and self-assured. But Haru is transparently meant to be the most timid character of the entire core party, if not the entire game. Even the story we do get is largely about her inability to flat out tell people no because she lacks the emotional strength to let people down. Or indeed, even ask them if she is letting them down. It's not that she's above dealing with her emotions, it's more that the game just kind of decides not to, and she's a weaker character for it. Here's a trick that Persona 5 likes to pull a lot. Introduce a character in the main story, then, when their main arc is done, add a confidant story that builds off what the main story did in a way that is lower stakes, but much more personal to the character themselves. Futaba does this, Ryuji does this, Makoto does this, hell, even Anne does this for like five minutes. The only one who doesn't do this is Haru. The closest thing we get to a serious continuation of the themes in her story is the reappearance of Haru's fiancé, which turns out to basically be a narrative cul-de-sac. Like, yeah, he's still a total prick, but he never seriously obstructs Haru after her father dies, and all it takes to get him to fuck off for the rest of the game is a single conversation with the new company president because he isn't a cartoonish monster. Which is its own kind of plot hole given what we know about Akumura, but that's completely beside the point. We never get to see this dickhead be put in his place for his actions. The last time we interact with him is at the end of Rank 6, and that's it. He's functionally gone forever. To be clear, she is well within her rights to find this guy repulsive and scummy. Her wanting to be as far away from this sentient dick wheel as possible is not just understandable, it's flat out realistic. The issue, rather, is that it ultimately contributes nothing. Haru already needed to have a difficult conversation with the company president because she doesn't like how corporate her... international franchise burger chain 
has gotten. <sighs> I am so tired. I mean, it sounds like I'm taking the piss, but that's ultimately what this arc is about at the end of the day. Jesus Christ, dude. And that story thread alone was going to be enough to get her where the writers wanted her to go, narratively speaking. She is already trying to maintain control and authority over her family's business and herself while a ton of people try and rip both of those things away from her. The fiancé adds so little here that he just feels like inexplicable padding, so much so that Haru asking the president to call off the marriage is a literal afterthought. The big issue is that her arc lacks serious stakes. She generally seems pretty okay. Maybe a little stressed, definitely has more on her plate than anyone her age should, but given all we know is going on in her life, she seems to be handling it without much difficulty, all things considered. She's laid back enough about it to spend all her time gardening at school. I'm not trying to downplay the very real problem she does have, but she never has a moment where it feels like she might not be able to handle it. In Robert McKee's book on screenwriting, Story, it is stated that I'm not going to be the 20th video essay dork to quote Robert McKee at you. I think that was or I'm pretty dry at this point. Thesis statement, struggle reveals character. The higher the stakes and the lower the odds for a character to succeed, the more likely they'll be to make an extreme choice that's revealing of their true character. As I've pointed out a million times at this point, Ryuji has nothing to gain and everything to lose by trying to help out his former teammates in his confidant arc. But he still does it anyways, and that speaks volumes about who he is and what he values. But what major choice does Haru have to make not just here, but basically ever? That she doesn't want to get married off to God's latest mistake over here? Like, yeah, valid, me too, dude. But that's just it. All it reveals is that she's basically just like any other person. She needed to be put into a position where she has to seriously sacrifice or risk something with intentional forethought. Risk your medical career to help those who are suffering. Leave the Yakuza to raise an orphan. Put your only non-professional friendship on the line to just try and keep that friend safe. Show me who you are. When looking at the strong choices she makes, choices that others wouldn't automatically make themselves, all we're really left with is that she wants to open a small coffee shop. And, credit where credit's due, fucking adorable. But it's not exactly a massive gamble for her, is it? What's the worst case scenario for her here? Oh no, my passion project failed. I guess I'm gonna have to just come over here and cry into my good burger bucks before trying again. She risks very little. And as a result, we learn very little. And that is a damn shame for someone who, as previously stated, has this much raw potential. This arc is fine. It works. Better than most, in fact. It's easy to follow, she has a clear goal from beginning to end, and Haru seems nice. Wish I'd gotten to know her. This does, however, finally lead us to the real issue at hand here. Why is it that with such a wide range of potential paths to go down, did they land on the one that was not only even barely on the list to begin with, but the one that feels like they had to try to squeeze blood from the stone in order to get enough material to make it worth doing? Why did we get this story? Why didn't we get the story of a wealthy heiress trying to fix an abusive company? Why didn't we get the story of an orphan daughter trying to make sense of her late father's devastating corporate legacy? Why didn't we get the story of someone trying to emotionally recover from being nearly sold off by her only family? Why did the game sidestep all of these incredibly obvious setups that would have, by their very nature, asked some really difficult questions, and instead went with the weakest, most milquetoast thread they could have possibly found? Why don't we hear about what becomes of Akumara's low-level workers? Why don't we get to hear about Yoshida's politics? Why is Hifumi's story seemingly more concerned with how she benefits from sexism rather than how it holds her back? Why couldn't Chihaya's arc be about the cult? Why is this game so eager to have my 16-year-old protag hook up with women in their 20s? Why is it that this game takes literally every chance it can to take shots at queer people? Why does this game try to obfuscate that Kamashita sexually abused his students? Why aren't we using our powers to actually reform society? Why can't this game be honest about what it's saying? This is getting annoying, isn't it? Fine, let's cut the shit and ask the real question. What is Persona 5's biggest problem? Quite simply, it is a game that will go on and on about the importance of rebelling, about how good and vital it is to rebel, but it seems generally pretty disinterested in specifying what it is exactly that you should be rebelling against. 
It talks a great deal about opposing individuals with power who use it to subjugate and harm those without, but it seems to almost intentionally avoid looking at and examining the power structures around those people. The same structures that allowed, supported, and rewarded people like literally every villain of this game with all the money, resources, and people they needed to enact their evil. The moment things get ideologically challenging though, Persona 5 almost always ceases to care. Why was this man allowed to have the innocent Ren arrested in the first place? Why did he have the power to be able to blackmail a woman into fabricating evidence that the police just accepted as fact based on his say alone? How did he acquire that power? What enables him to have it? If it's because he has a lot of money, then what does that mean? If it was because he was voted into office, then what does that mean? How was this, as an event, allowed to happen? The answer to that question is long and complicated and nuanced and difficult, so much so that answering it could have filled up an entire story by itself. You don't say, Persona. For most games, this would be fine. I don't necessarily expect a philosophical treatise on the moral nuances of how power is distributed in a modern society and how its unjust distribution can and must be combated in every JRPG I play. But this is Persona 5, the game that came after Persona 3 and 4. I'm not saying that those two games were the deepest, most narratively rich artworks humanity has ever created because that would be near Automata, but Persona 3 and 4 had a certain density to them. Those were games that made statements, but then they would ask questions that naturally follow from that statement. They dug deep into their subject matter and rejected easy answers to complex questions, quite literally in Persona 4's case. Death is inevitable and permanent, and this inherently makes life meaningless. So, what does that mean for us in our day-to-day -day life? Can we still find meaning, even if life doesn't have it inherently? Are human connections still worth making, even if we know how it will end? Is life still worth living? Human connections are indeed what make life worth living. So, can you truly make those connections if you don't know yourself? Can human connection create value even for a life that would otherwise have none? Don't our relationships with ourselves count as its own kind of human connection? And if so, shouldn't we do our best to treat ourselves with the same kind of kindness and patience with which we treat a friend? The villainous must be brought to justice, and if that means going against the law to do so, then rebelling against the law is ethically required. So? Not much. Most of the confidants are more interested in telling stories about people who are oppressed by unjust power, which does back up that ethical statement, but rarely if ever does it take an active interest in the questions that should naturally follow. Being a villain means having power. As such, why do these people have that power? Why do the unjust seem to be rewarded with power so often? If the problems are rooted in a subconscious desire from the populace to be ruled, then what can we do to wake people up to that? I'm not saying the game is lacking entirely in meaningful themes. Hell, over the course of this series, I pointed out a couple areas where it does them really well. I'm also not saying that this means that Persona 5 has bad writing, per se. What it does mean, though, is that this is a game with very, very different priorities from the games that came before it. Persona 3 and 4 were works that put their themes first and foremost. Persona 5, however, cares way more about its characters than its plot and themes. And I don't necessarily believe that this was a choice made out of pure creative drive. I keep talking about waifus and figmas, and this is why. Just saying, this game has the highest amount of major female NPCs out of the whole series, yet there are exactly three who you can't fuse Mara with. And they are two literal demon children and a major antagonist. Do you think that was an accident? Or maybe it could just be that having a wide array of broadly marketable cute anime girls that you can digitally kiss is one of the greatest ways for a Japanese company to print money. It's easy to see how this transpired. This isn't the first series I've seen fall prey to it. But this attitude does severely restrict the kind of female characters Persona 5 can have. And given that the majority of Persona 5's confidants are female, that is a real problem, even if you don't care about the sexism side of this. I can and most likely will talk about how much of a problem this issue specifically is, but suffice to say that Persona didn't become Atlas's biggest cash cow by selling body pillows of a theme. The more pressing point though is that this kind of merchandising would be pretty hard to square with the kind of game that would inevitably get to ask the question of, how come capitalism seems to give massive power to cruel bastard men so often? 
If they followed the premise of the story to its natural conclusion, they would have to inevitably address this question. But Persona 5 really, really doesn't want to do that. So the game pretends it isn't a problem. Just remove this one CEO and everything will be fixed, because that's how this stuff totally works, I promise. But that has its own message in it. It's not the system that allows people to be able to accumulate near-infinite money and power that's the problem. It's not that the rule of law is often enforced pretty arbitrarily with some people seemingly being above it. It's not even that we often give people power over others without the consent of the other party in the first place that's the problem. It's just individuals. It's just specific people who misuse their authority. It's just certain individuals who need to be replaced with better individuals. It's just this fucking giant cup. We will get into that in like another five parts or something. Persona 5 is a game that is terrified to take a hard stance on what it truly believes in. It will bring up individual problems with the world all day, but it refuses to look at the causes behind those problems with any kind of sincere curiosity. Persona 3 loved to talk about and examine death. Persona 4 loved to talk about and examine self-acceptance. Persona 5 does not share the same enthusiasm for its subject matter that its predecessors held for theirs. It likes to talk about rebellion, sure, but it doesn't like to examine it. This is what it looks like when an artwork is either lacking in confidence or faking passion. And I'm sincerely not sure which it is, or which would be worse. If it's lacking in the confidence needed to seriously tackle these issues, then that means it's a game that can't take its own advice. It'll tell us to cast off social norms and be true to our own justice, but it's too meek to even tell us what it personally thinks justice is. If it's the latter, then that means this thematic evasion is intentional, presumably because they realized that doing so wouldn't gel very well with the avalanche of Funko Pops they were about to unleash on the world and profit beat out integrity. And if that's true, well, now that I say it loud, I know which of the two is worse. There also remains the third possibility of maybe the people responsible for Persona 3 and 4 didn't even think to include these things, and I wonder if that's going to come up later. Hmm. As I've said already, I like this game, and its focus on character does do some great things for the overall experience. This game does undoubtedly have some of the best characters of the past decade. But then again, so did Persona 3 and 4. And those were able to have characters just as overflowing with depth and personality as anyone here while also having plots and themes that weren't constantly dismantling themselves to get there. And if you think all of this comparing Persona 5 to 3 and 4 is unfair, then I'd like to remind you of the second thing I said in this series. So the question I found myself asking as I played through Persona 5 wasn't, is this good? But rather, is this as good as Persona 3 and 4? Is that fair to the game? Nope. I, like a lot of people, am coming to this game with almost unrealistically high expectations. But I can promise they are no higher than the expectations set by the two games that came before it. And given how much of the core team from Persona 3 and 4 has remained around for 5, I don't think the expectations are unreasonable. In fact, it's not an expectation. It's a standard. Because they're the ones who set it. Yeah. That. More importantly though, let's not act like this isn't a game that, perhaps more than any other that came before it, wants you to know that it is a capital P Persona game. It's proud of its lineage and it wears it on its sleeve. So much so that it basically didn't change any part of the general structure from the previous two games despite the drastic change in theme, and dropped its Shimigami Tensei moniker. This isn't some bold break from series convention. It wants to be viewed as a Persona game. It wants to bank off that legacy. And I don't blame it for doing so. But when you do that, it inherently invites comparison to the older works. And frankly, this pales in that comparison. There's a whole lot more that could be said about how Persona 5 attempts to play off the legacy of the previous Persona games, both for artistic legitimacy as well as merchandisability, but we'll save that for later. TL fucking DR. Persona 5 is a lot like that one dude you met in your community college that one time who had an anarchy symbol ironed onto his denim jacket. But when you ask him how he feels about the writings of Peter Kropotkin, he just answers with a blank stare. He doesn't know, and he doesn't particularly care. He likes the idea of anti-authoritarianism. Not because he has meticulously considered how authority works and operates in our current society and has come to the conclusion that it's unethical for people with power to enact that power on those who never consented to be subservient to it or anything like that. Rather, he wears anti-authoritarianism in the same way someone may wear a Star Wars shirt. As a symbol more to indicate a fandom instead of any kind of legitimate political belief. Which really wouldn't be that bad if he weren't so goddamn self-righteous about it. 
And then you find out he sells those anarchy symbol iron-ons for 15 bucks a pop. And suddenly, everything about him just starts to ring a little hollow. Maybe that dude has some sincere, deeply held convictions, but it's next to impossible to read his actions as anything other than the exact kind of behavior that mindless self-indulgence was making fun of back in 2008. You'll rebel to anything, as long as it's not challenging. You don't mean it. <sighs> now, I'm sure it feels like I've given up the twist a bit here. Usually a rant like this would be saved for near the end when I'm getting ready to dunk on the thing once and for all, but I want to be clear that I bring it up here for good reason. This will allow us to get a clearer idea of what it is that actually makes Persona 5 a great game, and the ideas that it has that are actually worth taking away. Fortunately, the next section has plenty of that because, for the last time, this game is in fact very, very good. But soon, you. Continued in part six. Hey y'all, thanks for watching. I am never making a video this long again, Jesus Christ. I hope it was worth watching though. If you enjoyed that though, please kindly consider helping me out over on Patreon. Even just a dollar or two a month sincerely helps out a lot. On that note, I have to give a huge thank you to everyone who is currently helping to make these videos possible. People such as Thomas Hederman, Gescheit Gutspielt, Daniel Casey, Moo Ravel, Neo Nico, Rebirth Path, Kevin Thurber, Black Mage App, and everyone else who is currently helping me out. Thank you all so much. I legitimately cannot tell you guys how much you've helped me out. Sincerely, thank you. May vanish very briefly after this, but don't worry. We got a lot lined up. Future looks bright, y'all. Thank you again for watching. I love y'all. Peace.